Well, when times are going well, it seems like nothing could possibly disrupt our joy. Like when the good times are rolling, it seems like they're just going to roll on forever. I want you to think about a time in your life that was particularly idyllic and surreal, a moment that was sweet for you. What was going on in that moment? For our family, I think the, the last several months have been one of those times. It's been almost surreal, thinking back to about Christmas time all the way through Easter with the life phase that our family system is in. It has just been a special time. My oldest daughter is seven, my middle daughter is five, and my son David is four. And there at that phase that I've begun referring to as the golden years of parenting, now, candidly, I've thought that about every different phase. I've enjoyed the, the next phase a little bit more than I enjoyed the previous one. But this phase has just been especially special because I think, um, you know, our kids are sort of in that phase where they're still cute and cuddly and they still want to be with you. And also, their personalities are coming out, but they've got this innocence about them still, and so you want to be with them. It's just these incredibly sweet moments. And so it seems like every day I have a, a new story of something that has happened that is precious to us. So it was a couple of months ago, I was tucking my girls into bed, and they have lofted beds in their room, and I was standing on a stool, so I was eyeball to eyeball with my daughter, Bella. And she looked at me and she said, Daddy, why is it called pastor bedtime? And I had to think for a second. I said, no, 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 sweetheart, it's not, it's not past your bedtime. It's past your bedtime. Go to sleep. It's time to go to bed. <laughs> Seems like every day I've got a new story of these sweet moments in life. You remember a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Allen preached a sermon called Daughters, and he talked about the story of teaching his daughter to ride a bicycle, a two-wheel bicycle, and he talked about how when the training wheels came off, they were put in a shelf in the garage from whence they should never return. That's the language that Allen used. It was the next weekend that my son David said, hey, Daddy, I want to try to ride a two-wheeler. And so I got to escort him around as he was learning to ride his bicycle. This has been one of those prolonged seasons for us of what I've been referring to as the golden years. And when the good times are rolling, it seems like nothing could possibly happen to disrupt them. Except I've been a pastor long enough to know that often these great heights that we soar to, this great joy that is ours, too often we are like Icarus and we get a little too close to the sun and our wings of joy melt like wax and we come crashing into the sea. Just before Easter, a family friend of ours that we've known for many years was going to visit Southwest Florida and we try to see them every time they come down. They were going to have a vacation on Siesta Key, as they had done many times before, spending time on the beach, making family memories together. And the day before we were going to go up and visit them, the husband of the couple called me and said, you might not want to come up. Now, let me tell you a little bit about this couple. They're young. They're in their early 60s. And so the husband calls me and says, you might not want to come up. My wife fell in the condo, and she broke her hip. So this vacation that they had planned, the good times that they expected to have, were quickly disrupted by one false step, and their trip south went south in a hurry. She ended up spending the rest of vacation having a hip replacement and doing rehabilitation in the hospital so often in life. Those moments of joy are followed up by moments of heartache and sorrow. And just this last week, I was reading some statistics about families in the United States. The statistic absolutely staggered me. According to the Annie E. Casey Foundation study of the U.S. Census Bureau statistics, 35% of children are raised today across the United States in single-parent homes. Now, before I get to my point on that, let me pause to reflect on the nearly heroic work that our single parents often are doing. It is incredibly difficult to raise a kid today and give them the level of love and care that they need in order to thrive in today's world. The single parents are doing the work of two parents by themselves, and they're doing the best they can. So I'm not trying to shame them in the slightest. They are doing nearly heroic work. Here's my point 
about single parenting around the nation. Oftentimes, in our lives, we assume that life that has been before and the joy that was ours will continue on forever, but for a lot of kids around the United States today, one day that dream that things were always going to continue on the same way was disrupted. Because probably a difficult conversation was had between the parents and them, saying to them, look, look you know we're always going to love you, but mom and dad are getting a divorce. And the future, which seemed so secure before, is now disrupted, and the young folks are left wondering, who am I going to live with, and what are the holidays going to look like, and how often am I going to see mom or dad? So often our life seems secure, but one false step, and everything can go down south quickly. And it's not just individuals, and it's not just families that experience this. Actually, as a nation, we experienced this long ago. You know, the late 90s and early 2000s were a period of unprecedented economic prosperity across the nation. And we assumed that why wouldn't it just continue on this way forever until the financial sector, assuming that things would always continue on this way, started making some risky trades with subprime mortgages, and then 2007 happened. And the economy, which once was booming, and the futures, which looked secure, ended up crashing. The rug was pulled out from underneath us, and those who had jobs were daily. They knew what their routine was going to look like, lost their positions. And that income, which seemed so steady, was lost as well. There are times in life that are nearly perfect, where the joy in those moments we almost can't even bear in our hearts, and sometimes closely on the heels of those moments, we find great challenges in our life, don't we? One of the things that I love about the scriptures is how honest and candid they are with us about the struggles that we face in life. The psalm that we're going to be reading this morning is Psalm 30. Now, some scholars think that Psalm 30 actually has a companion psalm, Psalm 6. What was going on is the author David wrote in Psalm 6 about the enemies that had surrounded him on all sides and the great trouble that he was in. He said that my tears have been my food day and night. My tears are actually soaking the couch. And he prayed a prayer of deliverance to the Lord. And in Psalm 30, some scholars say are the psalms that were written based on the deliverance that David had experienced from the times of trouble that he had. What I want you to be listening for in this psalm is the polarity that seems to exist in our lives. There are times of great joy and there are times of great heartache and sometimes there's not much time in between. This is Psalm 30. Hear now the word of the Lord. I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths. And did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord my God, I called to you for help, and you healed me. Lord, you brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. And then he turns to invite the community of faith to join him in in his praises. He says, sing the praises of the Lord, you, his faithful people. Praise his holy name, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. Lord, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What is gained if I am silenced, if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me. Lord, be my help. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will praise your name forever, there is a polarity to life, isn't there? There are good times that seem like nothing could possibly disrupt the joy that is ours. And then there are difficult times that often follow close on the heels of those good times where the future looks bleak and uncertain. 
You and I have known this for a long time, and we have all sorts of images and metaphors that we try to use to talk about this reality. We talk about light and dark, day and night, winter and summer. All of these images help us to wrap our minds around life's polarity. So for example, when things aren't going well, we say things like, oh man, things are really going downhill, or things are really going south. Or we talk about things being dark. On the flip side, to talk about the good times, the times where our hearts are filled with joy, we use light imagery. We say to people when they've been downcast and dejected, don't worry, things are going to look up. Or we say there's a light at the end of the tunnel. We use all these images to try to grasp the complexity of the polarity of the life which we live. What I find fascinating about Psalm 30 is though it was written 3,000 years ago, we can readily hear and apply the imagery that David uses in there to refer to the polarity of life. Because in the psalm, David speaks about the reality that there are some times that we go down to the depths and we ask that the Lord lift us up. He talks about there are times where there is weeping, but soon there is dancing. He talks about how we've been clothed in sackcloth, a a stereotypical grieving and mourning image from the Old Testament, and then there are times that God clothes us with joy. There is a polarity to life, where there are good times and bad, joy and sorrow, sickness and in health, for richer or poorer. And sometimes, most of the time, we live somewhere between the poles. Because for most of us, Each individual day has some joy and some sorrow to it. Each individual week has some health and some sickness in it. Each given month has some good times and bad times. So most of our life is actually spent somewhere between the poles. But it's my conviction that though we spend most of our lives between the poles, we can actually learn quite a bit about life by looking at the poles in their extreme and following the spiritual pitfalls that could come upon us. So what I'd like to do with our remaining moments this morning is look at the positive pole when things are going well and look at the negative pole when things aren't going well and asking the question, what can we learn about our spiritual life between the poles in a way that we can orient our lives as we navigate between the poles? And because I'm an eternal optimist, we're going to start in the positive pole. When things are going well, it seems like nothing could possibly happen that would shake us, right? And we tend to come in those moments when we've been in a prolonged season of good times, we tend to approach suffering as though it's just a blip on the radar amidst the joy that God longs to give us. And maybe we even come to see that there's no hope or meaning in our suffering, but rather we were just created for joy. But often, we end up learning that in those times we need God all the more because we get a little bit too confident. To this, David writes, when I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. Lord, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. It's easy to feel like that when things are going well as though nothing could possibly disrupt the goodness that is ours and the great spiritual danger in these moments of prolonged joy is that we forget just how dependent on God we are. We see the blessings that God has given us, and we begin to think, well, God has especially favored us, and that favor will never go away, and perhaps we even deserve the favor that God has given us, and we begin to put our trust in the blessings as opposed to the one who blesses us. We misplace our trust and don't understand our dependence on God. You've been there, right? When you were young, you never worried about someday waking up in the morning and having aches and pains that you didn't expect to have? When things are going well, we just assume they're always going to be in that same vein, and we tend to put our trust in our own selves, in our human ingenuity, or in our own health, or in the wealth that God has given us. We tend to put our trust in those things as though they're going to continue on forever. And David reminds us, 
in the very next verse. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. In other words, those things that we put our trust in, if God were to just but look away, would wilt like a flower. Sometimes we tend to put our trust in our own human ingenuity, and then we realize that the complexity of the world is so great that sometimes there are problems that are just too big for us to solve on our own. Or sometimes we put our trust in our own health, and we think, God has fearfully and wonderfully made this immune system of mine until there's a time when a sickness comes upon us that our immune system couldn't ward off. Sometimes we have put our trust in our financial wealth that God has given us only to find that the next great recession comes and takes that savings and those investments that we had and makes them a fraction of what they were once worth. Whenever we place our trust in anything other than God, we will be let down. The great challenge, the spiritual challenge of the good times, of this positive pole is that we forget to place our trust in God and we misplace our trust in things. And one of the reasons I love the image of God and shining his face upon us, which is used throughout the Bible to talk about God's favor being upon us, one of the reasons I love that is because it properly reminds us of the order that we should see or place our trust in the world. In other words, we ought to place our trust in the giver of the blessings, not the blessings themselves. And this image is perfect because it reminds us of our utter dependence on God. I love the great benediction in the Old Testament found in the book of Numbers that says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. This is a reminder that all the blessings that we've been given have been given to us to be stewarded by God. But we don't place our trust in those. Because if God were to but look away, we might be dismayed. Having spent a little bit of time on the positive note and the spiritual pitfalls therein, let's talk about now when things go south. It will happen to all of us. None of us gets through this life without a season of hardship and difficulty, and sometimes in the midst of that difficulty, it becomes incredibly tough to remember the goodness of God. John Calvin, who was a brilliant theologian, a brilliant scholar, and an even more insightful interpreter of human nature, wrote in his commentary on Psalm 30 these words, If we are prosperous, we devour God's blessings without feeling that they are his. That's what we just talked about, right? Or at least we indolently allow them to slip away. But if anything sorrowful or adverse befall us, we immediately complain of his severity as if he had never dealt kindly and mercifully with us. Indeed, one of the great spiritual pitfalls when we're in those negative places, when things have gone south, is that we forget the goodness of God. Another reason I love Psalm 30, though, is some scholars have looked at Psalm 30 and looked at those first three verses that we read together, and they have sort of seen in them this beautiful image of a child being downcast, unable to see hope, as though the light at the end of the tunnel was so far away it was just a pinhole of light. The child is downcast, and in verses 1 through 3, there's a picture of God taking his child by the face and causing his child to look upon him. What I love about this is that God has already returned his gaze to the child, And the child who's downcast, who's forgotten the blessing of God, God takes the child by the face and causes him to look up and return the gaze back to God. So with that image in mind, here again, verses 1 through 3, I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead and spared me from going down to the pit. 
if the challenge of being in the spiritual negative pole when things have gone south is that we forget God's goodness, sometimes the only place that we can look is up. And God reminds us in those places that when God is all we've got, we know that God is all we need. And so it helps us to restore our dependence on God and also to return our trust to God, who's the only place that we can turn to when we're in those places. And what we find when we return our gaze to God is that God is unbelievably powerful to overcome. The story that this psalm harkens back to is actually the story of Jesus. Jesus was not only God's son, perfectly divine, he was also human. And he experienced life's sufferings and life's joys just like every one of us does, and he was not um, able to avoid the polarity of life. You remember, remember when Jesus was riding into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday? And the crowds were throwing palm branches before him and shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What a great high mountaintop experience that must have been. And then five days later, shortly on the heels of that, he hung on a cross. But the good news was that God didn't let him stay in that place. The reality is that although David said it was you that lifted me up from the realm of the dead, it was God who lifted Jesus up from the realm of the dead in order that we might experience resurrection through him. And if we will return our dependence to God and let God lift our faces and remind us that we can trust in him and his goodness, we will experience the deliverance that God has offered to us as well. Sometimes that deliverance doesn't come on this side of death, but it will come nonetheless. It's with great confidence in this that Paul actually writes in the book of Philippians about the hope that he finds in his suffering. He says this in Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. He says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection. How? By participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. My friends, When we are in the South Pole, if we allow God to reorient our lives back towards him, to lift our faces from despair, we will experience deliverance from our problems and our troubles. And not only that, here's the good news. When we experience that deliverance from God, he allows us to then glorify him, which is exactly what we were created for. We sing, thank you, Lord, for delivering us from all of our problems. And then our story becomes the testimony by which we can proclaim the goodness and glory of God to those around us. And so verses 4 and 5, he says, sing with me, all you faithful people of the glory of God who has lifted me from the depths. This is what we were meant for. So there's a surprising blessing that comes from being in that South Pole. I'm not sure if you've been following this news, but lately in the news, scientists have absolutely been bewildered by a phenomenon that's going on with our Earth's polarization. You'll know that we're on a planet that spins on its axis, and we have a North Pole and a South Pole. And sometimes we assume that uh, when we have a compass, that compass points actually to the North Pole, but actually doesn't point to the North Pole that we spin on its axis, but rather it points to the gravitational North Pole, which is a little bit off. Whereas the North Pole that our Earth spins on is fixed, the gravitational North Pole actually moves around. And what scholars or scientists have been baffled by is it seems that the gravitational North Pole has been moving at a more rapid pace. In fact, it's moving at almost 40 miles per year to the direction of Russia. Interesting. And it's causing all sorts of problems, actually. This rapid movement of the North Pole is causing problems with things as common as air travel. Tampa International Airport in 2011 actually had to name a runway differently because of this. Do you notice that 
some airports actually name their runways based on their orientation to the North Pole. And the shifting of the North Pole meant that they had to change the name of the runway, which was at 180 degrees to the North Pole, to 19 because of its orientation switch. You know, today, I think the complexity of the world and the pace of the world has, mean, has meant for us that the polarity shifts in our lives from north to south are coming faster and faster, and it can be really difficult to find our sense of orientation about our lives, and it causes really practical problems for us. And when we are disoriented, what we really need is a compass that will point us not to the shifting polarity of our lives, but rather a compass that points us to true north. And our trust in God is actually that compass for our lives. If we will restore our trust and remember God's, our dependence on God when things are going well and when things are going poorly for us, if we will place our trust in God and allow him to return our gaze to him, we will never be lost. It's actually for this reason that Paul follows up chapter 3 of Philippians with chapter 4 of Philippians when he said, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret to being content in any situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, whatever life's polarity. He says, the true north is this. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. There's this great polarity to life, isn't there? There are good times and bad times. The good times seem that they'll never end. The bad times can seem so bleak. In the midst of whatever circumstance you find yourself in today, know this, the true north, is placing our trust in the one who gives us all blessings and the only one who has the power to deliver us from any trouble that we are in. What would it look like for you to place your trust a little more firmly in this true north? Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, we are eternally thankful. You are the giver of all good things and you are the sustainer of all life. Every joyous blessing we have comes from your hand. In every moment of hardship, Lord, we'll never escape. But in every moment of hardship, we thank you that you are the way out. Give us faith that day by day, moment by moment, we may take more and more steps concerning orientation to your ways. Give us that compass, Lord, that points us to true north, that we may never walk without you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.